yeah, we are recording now. Can you all see this very techy first slide? Yeah, we can see the slide. Okay, now I don't really see whether there are people in the waiting room or how many people joined. So, Ricardo, if you tell me when I should start. Yeah, we have we have 17 people, 18 people now, and there's no waiting room anymore. So people can now just come in. So I think it is quarter past. So I think we can just get started and then people can join in uh, later on. I see now 19, so people are coming in, I think. Okay, so welcome everybody to this session, which is about pit graph services from the Freya project. And um, my name is Martin Fenner. I'm the data site technical director. And because everybody in Freya loves pits, there's also my ORCID ID um, on the first slide. What I will do is talk for maybe 15 minutes or so about Sort of a short summary of what we have built and some thinking that went into this, leaving us a lot of time for discussions and questions and suggestions. And um, maybe, I say maybe because it's always the risk to sort of demo live services, but I would try to do that after the slides for just a few minutes to, to show you um, sort of live service what we have built. And this is sort of a generic slides that I think is the same in all sessions. We will record this session. We'll make the recordings available afterwards and um, use chat if you have questions or comments. And Ricarda, if, if you could monitor that, that's a little bit easier while you're presenting. You don't yes. really see the chat so well. Yes, we'll do. So, this is about the pit graph. And pit graph is one of the three core concepts that we developed and then implemented in the Freya project, which is wrapping up this month. And pit graph is something we invented as a term, but of course it's a concept that's uh, probably familiar to most of you because um, that can be quite similar to similar activities. And I just randomly see Markus Stocker here uh, as one of the listeners and he has he's involved in something quite similar with a different focus called open knowledge graph. So the starting point is persistent identifiers for scholarly outputs such as publications, data sets and software. The researchers generating these outputs and the organizations supporting the researchers, whether it's their home institution or funding, et cetera. And all these resources and actors can be uniquely identified using persistent identifiers and PITs. And that's of course what the Freya project is about. Um, the newest PIT in this list is PIT organizations. And that's something that um, was launched during the last three years while Freya was ongoing and Freya partners were, are deeply involved in this. Then these PIDs have metadata and these metadata describe the resources, but they also help to make connections, whether it's a data set and a publication, uh, a person and software written by that person, organizations that um, are the home institution or the researchers that produce these outputs, etc. And when you combine this, the resources, the actors, and all these connections, then everything together, that's the pit graph. And this graph can is sort of first of all the concept, but it can then be explored and enables us to address unique questions that until now, before the pit graph were kind of difficult to address at scale. Okay. So 
the first technical problem, but actually looks fine. Um, something that we did in the Freya project as a general approach is um, before building anything, really make clear what is it that people need and identify use cases, user stories if we went in more detail, talk to the community, etc. And this is uh, a subset of the things that we identified at the beginning of Freya three years ago. This is something that's really helpful for a number of different reasons, but it's really kind of hard to do right now. And I give three examples. And again, this is not comprehensive. The first one is versioning, particular of software and data sets. Not versioning per se, but because that's, wouldn't say it's solved, but people know what to do. But um, bringing things together, which is, for example, um, if somebody to cite, decides to cite a data set, the particular version, then of course we want to see whether there are citations for other versions of the same data set and, and sort of lump them together. Um, very generic use case that we see it in many times in sort of slight nuances, aggregation, aggregation of research outputs. This could be by, by repository, by funder, by institution, or by person. And then again, not just here's all the papers and data sets and software that a particular researcher has uh, created over, over time, but also then aggregate uh, statistics. Um, so for example, from all the research outputs, what's the percentage that has an open license? What is sort of the number of downloads and citation and aggregate this together. And the third general use case is what I call here research object. That's a concept that's fairly well established. If you haven't heard this before, this is basically idea, the idea that nowadays a publication in the form of a PDF file, for example, that's not really the whole thing. That's just sort of the, the text that describes what was done. But what you really want to know is sort of what are the data underlying the publication? What is What are the software tools? Who are the people involved? Uh, what was the funding, et cetera? So research object is the aggregation of all these connected things. And this is just um, an idea to get you started that this is what pit graph is about. Uh, in the beginning of the project, we identified collectively over 40 use cases and we have all listed them all. Um, and there's more that can be added as input. And of course, some use cases are more important or more interesting for some people than others. So this slide gives you a sort of overview summary of how we have approached this. The, the first quarter and upper left corner, that's sort of the conceptual work that I just briefly described. Um, next question then is, if you know what you need, how do you build the technology supporting that? And one example is that the use case we found for the graph of connected scholarly resources, there weren't really any use cases where you need a graph with five or six connections. So the idea was not, for example, how can I identify that a particular researcher in computer science in Wales over multiple connections is connected to another researcher in Japan who's doing humanities. And I'm sure you can fight the connections, but that is not what our use case were about. Basically, all of them were a graph of two connections. So for example, um, from the use case I explained a moment ago, um, please show me all the research outputs by a particular institution and please give me a, a total number of citations to all these outputs or what's the percentage that have an open license or what's, what are, is the sort of disciplinary um, field that is covered, et cetera. That's two connections. It's not very hard, but it's already breaking sort of the standard infrastructure we have for these kinds of things. So it would be quite manual to do this uh, with existing infrastructure. And we decided uh, after trying to stretch our existing infrastructures, which basically is 
relational databases, search indexes, and REST APIs. We discovered it's really, really hard and we need something else. And we decided to use GraphQL as a technology. That's a very flexible query language uh, for querying graphs like a pit graph. And that work happened sort of maybe a year in into the project. So, which brings us to somewhere at the beginning of last year. So we started building uh, APIs using this technology and that would be something for discussion and to go, go into more technical details. And then after we had this sort of working, we Freya project released a sort of pre-release prototype version in May of 2019. Then we needed a way to sort of explore what we have there because APIs, even though GraphQL has a nice sort of web interface for queries, you want to have something that's more convenient. And what we then did next is use Jupyter Notebooks as something that's very popular to generate uh, and visualize reports for data sets. And as part of the Freya project, we generated a total of 10 official notebooks and they're all available from a specific website where you can go there, look at them, download them, reuse them, tweak them, et cetera. And we found this a very powerful approach uh, if you want to analyze data that you can use notebooks to get um, outputs to reuse existing ones, et cetera. And I will show you one example in a moment. And finally, we built something that's something we launched just uh, last month in October, we built something called data site commons, which is basically the web interface for the backend APIs we have built. Because again, most users don't want to work directly with APIs, they want to go to a web page, enter a search term or a PID, and then get the results they need. This is an example output from a Jupyter notebook. It's difficult to see the detail. What we did here is basically all the Freya project partners looking at the outputs we have generated a project. Uh, what are the sort of core authorships? And you see that we nicely work together. There's also a few people in the graph that are sort of external collaborators. Um, that's a typical thing you can easily do with a Jupyter notebook. There is the DUI for that notebook. So you can just, uh, when the slides are shared, you can download the notebook, um, run it on your own computer, tweak the visualizations, or for example, use a different project than Freya, use your own project if you're involved in, um, in a grant funded um, project, for example. And there are many uh, other outputs in these notebooks, not all visualizations, also just reports, et cetera. So now we're moving into the, the, the final part of our work, which is building a web interface that people can query. And what this slide shows is what, what are the data that we have made available. Again, everything starts with persistent identifiers and then continues with connections with patterns and identifiers. And what you see here, and it's not exactly live data, but it's sort of updated frequently. We have 40,000 pits in the fire pit graph, which includes DUIs from data site and Crossref, ORCID IDs from ORCID, and ROAR research organization identifiers. And you also see that we have everything from data site we have a subset in terms of both DUIs and metadata from Crossref. Currently, we are about 8%. And we have everything from ORCID in terms of identifiers and a subset in terms of metadata. And for ROAR, we have everything. And what is important is how we bring the data together. ORCID and ROAR is both live data that are never stored somewhere else, but we, we basically query them when we need them. Crossref is different. That's why there's only a subset because Crossref and dataset DUIs are so similar that we want to sort of import them 
into one common search index. And for that, uh, there's sort of more work needed and it's not live data, but it's it's a subset of pre-processed data, but that makes it much easier, for example, to do detailed queries. We have some other data in the PID graph, notably Wikidata and Unpayable. And we hope that this, this grows over the coming months and years because it's, it's a very open infrastructure. It only requires to use PIDs and have metadata that describe the resources and allow you to make connections. And Crossref, if you don't know that, they have, I think about 117 million DUIs now. So there's a way to go, but scaling this up is not trivial. So we will continue doing this and hope that we get um, to have complete coverage of uh, Crossref at some point in the future. Uh, as I show in a slide in a moment, there's more DOI registration agencies and data set in process, and we have some data from these other organizations as well. So data site comments, first of all, is just a discovery service for research resources with PITs, which includes works, which we use as a generic term for research outputs, which could be publications, data sets, software, and other things. And then we can search them all in one place. And here's an example search in a screenshot, searching for climate change. And you see uh, in the facet on the left, what kind of work types we find. You can also search for people or organizations, and that's all in one search interface. And that's sort of one of the interesting aspects of this, that you don't have to go to three different places. You can search in one search interface. And as you see in a moment, these things are then also uh, all connected to each other. This is the numbers as of today. Um, we have all DUIs for data site in the system. That's about 20 million. We have, um, sorry, the, the screenshot a moment ago was taken a, a few days earlier. So the numbers don't exactly match. So we have Crossref uh, subset, and we have just a few DUIs from other DUI registration agency, um, which is really just to show the principle, but this is by no way comprehensive. And the reason we have them now is that they are sort of already in, um, included in, in the Crossref metadata search. So there is a little bit of uh, data, so you can see that, for example, the Korean DUI registration agency, KISTI, you also find content from them. And of course, research is international. So you shouldn't be restricted by where the DUI was registered and also not restricted whether you're searching for publications versus data sets versus other content types. We can do all in one place. And that is sort of one of the major promises that we made with Freya and the pit graph, that there's one place to search for everything that has a DUI and also um, people and organizations using ORCID and WAR. Um, this slide, and I'm coming to the end, um, shows now sort of the pit graph aspect. So here, this is a view, and you see the URL there, um, about a particular organization. In this case, it's the German research organization, which has a raw identifier. And then other than some basic information about this organization, we also show all the works, so publications, data sets, software that are associated with this organization. And the way we associate can be uh, different ways. Typically it's, it's the sort of author affiliation, but as in this case, it can also be funding information using Prosper funder ID identifiers or um, authors being not people, but organizations, uh, sort of research groups, for example, as an author. And finally, it can also be um, a repository from a particular organization. 
So here it's really funding by, by a German funder and everything we have. And as I said, pit graph is not just generating that list, but then we can aggregate. So for example, we see that we currently know about 80,000 research outputs and that all, almost all of them are publications. So that's 77,000 of them. Um, and there isn't really much funded outputs at least that we find that are, for example, for software or for physical objects or other kinds of um, resource. And what you also see um, is what are the open licenses. So as a funder, you're usually interested that everything you fund is publicly available. And this is a nice way to see the details because there's of course a variety of licenses and just see how close you are to everything has an open license and can be reused. And that's an example for aggregation for sort of a very simple pit graph example. What you see on top is sort of aggregations of reuse uh, in a form of citation views and downloads. And what you basically see there for the views and downloads that this, these numbers are small and that's just because it's still very difficult um, to track views and downloads. That's not something that, for example, each data repository uh, routinely provides yet. Uh, citations you see, for example, we find about 100,000 citations for these uh, outputs. And that's something that right now is just a high level summary, but that's exactly what you can do with pit graph and can, can go in more detail. And that was my last slide. Um, I hope you have questions in the 20 minutes or so that remain. And if you have questions sort of beyond today, the best place to go is probably the pit forum where you can ask questions, give feedback, et cetera, everything around pits. That's something that the Freya project has started. Here's the URL to the particular section in the pit forum about pit graph. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, for your presentation and for sort of giving a, an overview of what we have been doing in Freya. So there were no questions yet in the chat, just that Marco Stocker the, um, shared some information on the open research knowledge graph, which I think is useful for people, which you mentioned at the beginning. So um, yeah, I would invite people to ask questions and you can do that in the chat, but we're also relatively uh, reasonable group. So if people want to unmute themselves and ask questions directly, I think that would also be fine. Um, so yeah, curious to hear your thoughts and questions. Uh, yeah, hello, this is Mark van der Zanne. I have a question. Uh, the, the PAD graph is very much focused on, on DOIs, uh, BORs and, uh, and ORCIDs. Uh, if you want to go beyond uh, is this possible? Uh, can you include other PDs? And what is the procedure if you want to uh, do this? Oh, it's absolutely um, open to PIDs beyond basically PIDs that were sort of mainly used in, by prior project partners. Um, I think there is there's an easy answer and a complicated answer. The easy answer is if you have PID and metadata that, for example, also include connect to other PIDs, um, then we can just include this by integrating with the REST API. That's what, for example, we are doing with organization identifiers. There's a total of about 100,000 raw IDs, and that's fairly simple to sort of wrap this in GraphQL and, and show it in the system. Um, if you uh, it gets more complicated if you use PIDs where there's millions of them, uh, but as you see with ORCID, the external integration works fine. So there isn't really any difference between integrating with ORCID and integrating with, for example, a handle system. Um, the complicated way is to use GraphQL as a technology because this is a technology that can be federated and sort of you can, multiple services can run their own API and this can sort of can be combined. Um, I have GraphQL is a very popular technology, but mostly outside of the scholarly community. 
So probably in most cases starting with a REST API and seeing how this can be integrated makes, makes the most sense. Okay, thank you. And what we don't have yet from the Freya project is sort of a tutorial or something very hands-on and very concrete what can be done. But I think the starting point is starting a conversation and then it shouldn't be super complicated if, if you have a nice PID system that does something else. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Mark. Are there other questions? Yes, um, hi, this is um, Tommy from CSC in Finland. Um, in your in the blog that you had on the Freya, um, you were talking about the REST APIs as a part of this um, BitGraph approach. But on the other hand, it's also like interlinking research outputs via PIDs. It's also a kind of a concept, conceptual uh, notion. So um, if you just start combining PIDs to each other without using RESTful APIs, would you still consider that the PID graph? I think there's two answers. Again, we started out obviously with a concept and an idea and we have used the term PID graph very loosely because it's really just connecting um, resources that have PIDs. Um, but I think you will hit the wall at some point with the flexibility of your queries or the complexity of connections. And that's why we at some point move from REST API to GraphQL. Um, yeah. So, so and, and I think internally and also because this was evolving, we use the term a little bit in both ways. Um, mm. So using a specific technical implementation and using a concept, but I think that's probably not uncommon for these activities, especially because it's still at the beginning. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm uh, very interested in this because I'm in the process of building a national CRIS for Finland where we indeed connect the publications with the research data sets, with the infrastructures, with basically everything. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm building a PID graph uh, in a way, but it's just that it's all in one system. Yeah, and I think there's probably a spectrum of on one end is REST APIs, which is probably the most widely API technology used now. And that's sort of most of us are familiar with that. And then you have GraphQL, which is a technology that's gaining a lot of ground. Mm but maybe not so much in this colleague community. And then one other step is of course, to use um, RDF and Sparkle, which again, of course, tries to address similar questions. And I think the spectrum is sort of increases your flexibility and possibilities, but it also increases the complexity of the system. And we felt that for Freya, this is a good middle ground. GraphQL is um, so popular in in other places that, that there's a lot of techn technology that can be used both for the API side and for the client side. So for example, React, which is what we're using here as a JavaScript framework in data set commons, that's the most widely used JavaScript framework right now. And it sort of prefers to use uh, GraphQL over REST. So if, if you wanna have a system that's super flexible uh, so, for example, Wikidata is, a, is, of course, a popular example that's also used in Scholarly Community. Then, um, of course, Sparkle is interesting, but it makes makes the simple things also harder. And it's sort of a spectrum where I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all solution. In Freya, we had wanted to focus on the things that are sort of common use cases and optimize the use of them. For example, in notebooks, that it was really easy to write Jupyter notebooks with GraphQL because it's... Uh, it's fairly standardized. So that's one general comment regarding why should you use GraphQL or why should you not use REST APIs or Sparkle? Um, and it really depends on what you want to do. And also, if you build the system yourself completely, you can use whatever technology you want. But if you want to integrate with existing systems, then you have, of course, to think about what other people are commonly using and the data you want to have in your system, how, what, yeah. Oh, they are available. 
Um, a different answer would be that what we do with connecting research outputs, people and organizations, which also which includes the research organization funding, that's of course very sort of a lightweight version of a quiz system. So the kinds of questions you might want to ask, there's a lot of overlap. Um, typically, we have looked at this more from a sort of high level view. So for example, a funder, what is, what is all the funded outputs? Because the funder might not use a quiz because that's typically used in, in research institution. But at the end of the day, there's sort of lots of overlap. And that's sort of the right moment to say that the Research Data Alliance has an interest group, which is called Open Science Graphs, because many people work on this and there's always the same problems and how can we coordinate? Yeah, so kind of jumping on that, um, if you, for example, have this data uh, site commons as a repository of research graph information, and uh, at some point in the future, I will have one as well. So uh, is it possible for me to start harvesting your connections from the data site commons? Or how would you see this exchange of information about, by the separate research graph entities? Um, again, there is a, sort of a generic way to exchange data, which can be everything from data dumps to REST APIs. And then there is a specific one for this technical uh, implementation, which is called GraphQL Federation. So there's nice open source tools. We also do this internally where you basically can ingest another GraphQL API, the part you're interested in, um, which could, for example, be, it is probably 95% what's in there is not relevant for you because it's um, research that somebody did somewhere else. But if you're interested in research organizations or uh, researchers, so ORCID now has passed 10 million uh, registered users. So you, you can just pick the pieces you want and GraphQL has a standard way of incorporating this. This would be live API calls. If you want to store the data yourself, then you take a different solution. But ORCID, for example, provides a data dump, as you probably know, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. we're harvesting from ORCID already. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Tommy, for your question. So I'm wondering if there are more questions. Also feel free to uh, put things in the chat if you want, but we're welcoming people to unmute and have a discussion. And while you think about this, just a brief comment on what Marcus said earlier on about the open knowledge or the open research knowledge graph. That is an example where the focus is slightly different, um, which makes it uh, interesting how these two graphs can interoperate. I don't know, Marcus, whether you want to say something, because I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think this is an example of a graph where lots of things are similar and we, sh we should and have started to work together, but uh, there are sort of variations that the PIT graph is not really a knowledge graph and there are sort of different use cases that are addressed by these different graphs. Yes, um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have my little one in the background, so I'm on and off, but um, completely agree. So we are applying, as I mentioned in the in the chat comment, we are trying to use now uh, increasingly also DOIs, data side DOIs to identify products uh, that are generated in the ORKG. I think the, the key difference is really that um, um, in addition to the metadata, we are trying to capture more of the information content, uh, specifically in papers, and try to link together um, that content um, and apply persistent identification at that level as well. So maybe that's as much as I say in addition to what you said. Thank you for the introduction and mentioning ORKG as well. Yeah, no, I think it's important that uh, building scholarly graphs is not a Freya invention. Uh, open Air, for example, has, of course, also an open air graph. There's different approaches and different primary use cases. And that's why there are also differences, but I think that's fine. It's just that these things interoperate because at the end of the day, this is an EOS symposium. It's all about um, interconnecting what people are doing 
And uh, this is an example where there's a nice community around these graphs that's sort of evolving um, because of, um, of course, uh, COVID things were a little bit slower this year, but we started a uh, research data alliance interest group on this topic because it's there was enough interest and we had two sessions at RDA so far and I, I'm sure this will, will continue. Good. May I uh, ask a follow-up question about the open, hi Martin, that's very nice, um, the open Ooh. knowledge um, research graph as well, and, and maybe Marcus has answered. It strikes me that there's something a bit similar to between that and clinicaltrials.gov, which is trying to capture the content of the paper, of, or perhaps not in as in a structured way, although without the link to persistent identifiers for each bit. But um, I was just wondering if uh, you were uh, um, could comment on that if you if you know about clinicaltrials.gov as well. Um, I, Katrina, um, no, sorry, we we have uh, not known about that one, but I can spot so. Absolutely, there are various um, domains and communities uh, that have built um, specific discipline, um, specific databases to collect um, and structure information uh, in their domain out of literature. So that's in principle um, nothing really new that has been done for a long time. And if you think about meta studies, each meta studies, meta analysis do this kind of work. Um, to build uh, databases and then, um, you know, uh, do analysis on top of their databases. Um, it's not that often they don't publish these databases, this research data in the end. Um, and the Open Research Knowledge Graph um, tries to address a little bit the question why this has not, um, you know, scaled up uh, in scholarly communication more generally. So we have seen uh, in many disciplines, various efforts in this the direction. That's completely true. The big question is why um, are we publishing this information still buried in PDF, so to say, um, and we don't have uh, the information, data information and knowledge communicated in the literature more in, in, in fair, you know, following the fair principles. So as interoperable, reusable also for the machines, but yeah. I think, and how do we get there? That's perhaps the main question. Yeah, no, I think that's that's really interesting. The clinical trials one does does try and link to exactly the data, and it's compulsory to register your trial before you start the work, and then collect all the work and report back the outcomes. Um, so um, you could uh, almost do that from preprint to paper at one level. <laughs> You know, uh, since this is something that clinical trials I've spent also a few years of my life on, um, there are a few issues that make this a little bit harder, even though it's so important. One is uh, identifiers. Mm -hmm. So the community has not been able to find a unique identifier for a clinical trial. There are sort of various important systems, but that's tricky. Then, of course, there is something about privacy, which mm -hmm. the um, patient data is, of course, something you cannot just open up. Um, and then a lot of clinical trials also have commercial interests. That is not as open science as, as um, some of the things we're talking about here this week. That just makes it harder because if there's a financial interest, uh, that just doesn't drive openness. Um, but there is a European research infrastructure that you might know, ECRAN, or ECRAN, that is basically about uh, improving um, infrastructure on clinical trials that in Europe that are, is then focused mostly on academic clinical trials, where there's lots of them, and sort of giving recommendations about how you should publish data uh, if they're sort of uh, privacy of patient data involved, etc. So I think there is something and then do, uh, and of course, meta analysis, uh, sort of not just reading the summaries of trials, but taking the data and combining them with other trials. I mean, that's sort of a good example of uh, what Marcus is doing there, that that's 
can be much more um, powerful than just reading a sort of text summary. Yeah. Are there other questions people want to comment or ask something else? Uh, the question about the, the 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 federation aspect because now uh, in this session we already have heard uh, different initiatives already have some some services available uh, but they all look at uh, what type of information to connect or how to integrate different sources uh, are there any initiatives already or maybe it is already working i don't know uh, that the, the the different graph initiatives already are interlinked to each other so that you can search through one go to the other uh, and finding information uh, it's almost funny that you say that mark because that's sort of very much on top of the list of the rda interest group how to exchange data um, and there has been some initial discussion and that's sort of clearly identified as one of the things we should address, that there's different use cases and different technologies, but exchanging information should, should be easy and possible. And probably, that's just my, my, my feeling, is the exchange format is something very different from technologies we use, because it's probably, um, and that's our experience with, with data citations in RDA and something called colleagues, that you probably the information is probably easiest to be broken down into smaller pieces. For example, uh, the connections between the data set of a publication, and then uh, each system can ingest this and um, put together using the technology they use. Or So I think the data depth, how this looks like, will be very different what, for example, in Freya we're currently using, but I look forward that there is progress what you see right now there's because most of these data are open data that there's just a lot of duplication and and overlap what's in one system or in another and um, what open air is doing and what freya is doing is a perfect example for things that are very close to each other but we haven't sort of optimized the, the exchange of information yeah that 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 is what i currently also see is that uh, everyone has his own uh, a focus uh, how to get information, how to present information, but it will be very interesting if you in can interlink those those different sources, so that you can easily uh, go from one to the other and uh, relate mm -hmm. uh, uh, from different sources in itself. No, I, I, I think I think that's almost uh, also looking at the clock is also almost a closing statement that that's sort of the driver for these activities that we don't build new silos, but that it becomes easier to connect different resources together. Um, and again, what's important for Freya that we always like strong use case that drive all this and not some technical geek like me thinking, oh, that's a cool technology that builds something, but really what are the problems we need to solve? And a lot of this needs some graph or another. And I think there's sort of, there's a good path forward in, in coordinating more with similar initiatives. Yeah, I think this actually is a very nice, very nice closing statement. Also, as as Freya is sort of rounding up its work, um, I think a lot of the work that we have been doing will continue in the future. And I think this is really nice in, in the RDA group Mar uh, Martin mentioned and also in other initiatives. So if there are no other questions, then I think we'll um, end this session. Thank you, Martin, for the presentation. Thank you all for being here and for asking questions. Um, this is, of course, the first day of the conference. So there are lots of uh, sessions on PITS and Freya that you could still visit. Um, so I've posted a link in the chat um, to an overview of the sessions that um, might be relevant for people interested in PITS. So um, do join. And also um, the materials will be made available afterwards, so recordings as well as slides. And if you have time during the breaks, there's also a Freya booth. So if you have specific questions, um, something you could not um, ask uh, today, you can always come by there and some of us will be there and um, you can chat with us and ask questions there. So um, yeah, I think with this, I would like to close the session and I wish you all a nice afternoon. Bye. That's great. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I don't know if Marcus is there, still there, but I put something in the chat for you, Marcus.
Yes, I saw it. Thanks. I Great. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. Bye bye.